Just ahead on American Black Journal, a Detroit museum dedicated to African Americans in media celebrates its first anniversary. Plus, two educational institutions team up to make the community healthier and expert advice for people who get in trouble with the law. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson and glad to have you with us for this first show of 2018. This is a really big year for us on American Black Journal as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of this program on Detroit Public Television. We're proud to be America's longest running locally produced television show. My first guests today also became part of television history when they were hired as news anchors for the country's first African-American owned and operated television station, WGPR Channel 62. The Detroit station went on the air in 1975 with Big City News. Uh, Big City reporters Amir Porter and Pal Q. And perhaps it'd be best if we paused here and let them tell you exactly what's happening out there news-wise. Thank you, Jerry. I'm Amir Porter. In the news today, a Detroit man is shot to death during a hold-up attempt and a weekend search for Jimmy Hoffa has turned up nothing. Detroit becomes a convention spot next week for hundreds of Latino women. And two black men in Atlanta have come up with a new invention. I'm Pal DeCue. Details of these and other stories in a moment. The original WGPR TV studio on East Jefferson is now a museum. Named after the station's founder, Dr. William Banks, the museum will celebrate its first anniversary with a public event on Martin Luther King Day. Joining me now are former WGPR TV news anchors Amir Makeupson and Doug Morrison. Thank you both for being here on American Black Journal. Pleasure being here. Steve. Yes. So I have to say, first of all, that uh, as someone who grew up here in the city of Detroit, uh, I grew up watching the two of you on that show on WGPR. Uh, I don't think I would have been watching in 1975 because I would have been four years old, but <laughs> but certainly later in my childhood, uh, you guys were familiar faces. So it's really an honor to be here uh, with two Detroit institutions on well, the show. Well, it's our pleasure to be here as well. And uh, one thing you should know is that uh, since our days at TV 62, <laughs> this is the first time that Amir and I have shared a set. Right, right, right. Then that's uh, that's great history too, right? Here uh, used to be a lot longer. <laughs> a lot longer. <laughs> that's right, right. So so let's go back to that first broadcast in 1975 of Big City News. This is uh, this very novel conceit, this idea of a, a black owned and operated television station and a newscast with African Americans uh, reporting and, and talking about the news. Well, we, were, we had a wonderful opportunity and that's what we saw it as. We had jobs in an industry that that's what we wanted to do. We had no idea, Stephen, that we were becoming a, a major part of history, a major part of 
culture, our heritage, that's a Detroit story, that's a national story. Sure. So we were able to do that, and it just was a fascinating opportunity that uh, we're all very grateful for. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It was, it was really an opportunity that I didn't anticipate because I wasn't scheduled to be the anchor for the Oh, is that news. right? Right. They had brought up a gentleman from, uh, I believe, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. And uh, he had a falling out with our boss. <laughs> and so he walked off the job and the boss said, you got it. You're so up, right? <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, if you look at the set, obviously then, I mean, it's the 70s. Lit. Everything looks the really differently than countries. it does Gifts now, but it was different different there than it would have been at other other places too. I mean, this was a pretty spare operation. Wasn't it? Yeah, pretty. It kind of looked like Donna Reed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you just some basic stuff. And I remember, I remember Jerry Blocker saying, who 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 was recruited from Channel Four, mm -hmm. and who went over there as the first news director. And I, he looked at the set, and I remember him saying, "I wanted that that Detroit to be back further, you know." Mm -hmm. Uh, but but it was done, and that's what we went with. And, yeah. and as far as we were concerned, we had the best set in town. <laughs> right. We were happy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. The a, a spare set, but the technology was there. We were leading the market in technology. Mm -hmm. We had the first ENG electronic news gathering equipment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we would uh, didn't have to go with um, film and develop film. We could go right to air with our video cassettes. Right, right. Um, uh, talk about what was going on in the city newswise at that point. We, we hear you talk about Jimmy Hoffa, the search for Jimmy Hoffa. That's something that some people might remember, but, but uh, you know, the focus of this, uh, of this newscast often was on African-Americans and African-American issues that weren't being covered. Uh, we try to tell the story that other people maybe were not telling or yeah. telling a little lighter. As I recall, Doug, um, Angela Davis times and- uh, Sure. Uh, oh gosh, it was. And, and and locally, we did a lot with uh, organizations like Black United Fund. Right, right, right. Uh, things that we felt that people should know about who may not necessarily have known or had the opportunity to learn. Yeah. Um, I, we probably try to do a little too much because you want to cover all of it and you only have, <laughs> you're so limited by time and space as we all know. But we tried to do stories that were relevant to the black community yeah. and just as important as any of the other stories may have been. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, was there any pushback to this when this happened? I mean, were, were there people in the city who said, you know, black people don't belong on the, on the news desk. Don't, there shouldn't be black people. Uh, there was, I was not news. aware of that. I, I wasn't either, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, I was out in the field quite a bit and I, all the other, uh, all of my colleagues at that time were were very supportive. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, this was a time when it was harder still for African Americans to get jobs on, on uh, the other stations, the big That was stations. a big point. Yeah. We were trying to offer opportunities to people such as Doug and myself who may not have otherwise had that opportunity. We didn't know a whole lot. I mean, we, we were basic. We knew the basics, but but uh, we were given an opportunity to really learn and really grow and really expand, which so many of us did in so many different areas. Yeah. And as you know, people who you'll never, you don't know their names, you don't know who they are, but writers and producers and mm -hmm. directors and people that you even have here at... Uh, at, at DPTV, right, or, right. or people who worked at uh, GPR. Right, right. right. sure. Yeah, uh, both of you also experienced that, that opportunity. I remember, I remember you being on Channel 50, and mm -hmm. it was also when I was a teenager, I think. Uh, but I was but, there for 28 years. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And which never would have happened had it not been for, uh, uh, for our station here, for WGPR, which is what I'm exceedingly grateful for. But to talk about the, um, uh, the museum, mm -hmm. uh, and the first anniversary of that museum, it, it comes to mind because it, we were able to convene alumni that, I didn't know you worked there, I didn't know you worked there. Because it was on the air for a decent amount of time. Some yeah. of us were early, middle, late. Some, uh, Joe Spencer, for example, who started almost at day one and stayed until the very last day. Yeah. But it was, an, you know, to, to get these people together to do this, uh, which is why we, we want people to come to the, to the to the event. Our celebration, yeah. the an first anniversary of the museum. You're going to see all kinds of amazing things. We have people say, I didn't know you had that. I didn't know you had the <laughs> timeline. I didn't realize that. We have visitors come, and they're going to have so many opportunities. One of them, 
I'm going to be quiet after this. <laughs> One of them, you know, you can go in and say, well, I want to be a news anchor. I want to be a talk show host. I want to do this or that. You're going to be able to do that. Just sit and, yes, and try sit it Yes, and out. interview someone, yeah. have a tape of it, and get a feel for what it is, give you a better understanding. We're offering all kinds of fun and exciting things at this at, yeah. our, at our anniversary. Yeah, and then the, the museum, we've had folks in the museum here uh, over the last year a, a couple times every time I'm excited about it because I, I feel like uh, uh, it is a really different kind of place than the other museums in town and in, in, in the way that it uh, that commemorates and celebrates this really important. Uh, it is, and it's not just WGPR-centric. Right. We have a timeline of, of significant events in black media. Mm -hmm. We also feature the homegrown media stars that are in the market today mm -hmm. and were in the market yesterday. Yes. So it, it's not uh, something that's just based on WGPR. Right, right. Uh, I, I wonder, as pioneers in black media, what do you think of uh, media today and diversity in it and the need f still for, for black focused media? I would say there still aren't many males in, black, in media today. That's really true, yeah. Uh, the black male has not achieved the same uh, penetration uh -huh. that, the, uh, that the black female has in, oh. in media today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, your your, your career uh, uh, would look very different to people, I think, today, uh, if they were thinking about it. But but there are still some of the same kind of barriers, right? Well, there are. Although I think there's been tremendous improvement, there's always a lot of room for improvement. You know, there was a time. Uh, you know, there there was a lot of tokenism for the men, for the women. But I think that there's a lot more opportunity now, and I think there are a lot more positions locally and nationally. I mean, you would never, you would never, in the 70s, never have seen what we have now. I think it's a good thing. Um, I think there's, again, a lot of room for improvement, but, I, but, but we've made strides that I think are wonderful. And I like to tell people that because they get so discouraged, young people. Just, you know, hang in there and yeah. do your thing and be the best you can be. And I know I was hired for racial reasons or, or gender reasons. I don't care why you hire me. Just hire me. And, and I'm let me do the to work, you, right? right? That, that yeah. I was the right decision, whether you really thought so or not. That's the message I try to get across. There's more opportunity today, though, I, I yeah. think. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, great to have you both here, and congratulations on the first anniversary of the museum. And congratulations, number yeah. one, on 50th, 50th for the show. 50th anniversary on this show. Ten for you. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's right. It's close to, to a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Getting long in the tooth here, right? All right. Uh, coming up next, details on a free health fair. But first, we're taking a look back at some of the guests on this program over the past 50 years. Here's a 1995 Detroit Black Journal interview with the legendary WGPR radio personality, the electrifying mojo. Welcome to Detroit Black Journal, Mojo. Well, Daryl, thank you very much for having me here. This is definitely a profound experience for me. I'm going to, uh, by way of explanation for our viewers, uh, indicate that uh, for years in Detroit, one of the things that has uh, been a part of your celebrity, if we can put it that way, is your anonymity. And that is why we cannot see exactly what you look like. Uh, how did that part of your persona become established? Um, I've always just wanted to remain uh, a voice on the radio, a uh, face in the crowd, a figment of the imagination. I think that, you know, when you uh, are elevated too high on a pedestal, uh, you remove yourself from the earshot of what um, regular people have to say and how they feel and sometimes it makes it impossible to relate on a, a relative level. A local high school and university are teaming up to make the community healthier. Chandler Park Academy and the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine are holding their sixth annual family health fair on the Friday after the Martin Luther King holiday. It's their commitment to a day of service. Here to tell us more are the fair coordinators, Kelvin Wise, STEM coordinator for Chandler Park Academy, and Karen Reed Hendon, who is Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. Welcome both of you to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I love this program partially because it's a university and a school teaming up to deal with uh, really important issues uh, in, a, in a community. Um, talk about why, why this is an important partnership and what it's meant to that community over six years now. 
Yeah, it's, it's amazing that it's been six years that we've been doing this kind of work. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's probably more important from my standpoint anyway to make sure that uh, our young students are able to see what's possible if they try to look ahead, you know, another 10, 15 years in their life about potentially going into medicine. Right. So um, I think the thing that's probably biggest for us is just making sure that our medical students are interacting really well with the community that they're serving and that the community can see that that's what their future can look like. Yeah, I, I imagine that's sort of a tough sell maybe to, to medical students, the, the idea of urban primary care, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of other sexy things you can go do with a medical degree that pay you a lot more money, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, in a lot of ways, of course. <laughs> um, but I think the thing that's biggest is that for many of our students, um, serving the community is pretty much in their blood. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the tenets of Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine, uh -huh. is that we are committed to serving the community. Yeah. And so the kinds of students that come into our hallowed halls to learn about medicine and working with the community, they get that opportunity working with Chandler Park. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about uh, what's going on at Chandler Park uh, Academy with regard to this program and, and more broadly. Well, this year will be our, our sixth annual health fair. Um, it allows us an opportunity to, one, invite the public in um, to receive information, in this, in this case, obviously, information regarding their health, but we let the public in, as well as our students, who have also have an opportunity to take advantage of the information and of the screenings that are available to them through this, uh, through this health fair. Yeah, uh, I, I would imagine that, that this is as of much value to the families as it is to the kids themselves, right? It, it is, it certainly is. And obviously, knowing, we, uh, as I was saying, knowing your numbers, getting some early screenings, um, and then helping to keep you healthy is, is very valuable in terms of the knowledge base. And also sometimes, um, you know, every now and then we get some, some surprises and students and community members find out information that they, where they weren't that aware That they didn't about. know. Right. Wow, wow. Uh, tell me a little about the, the community that Chandler Park uh, Academy serves. Uh, Chandler Park is located in Harper Woods, but mm -hmm. the predominantly 95% um, of our students come from Detroit mm -hmm. um, and some and the other five within the surrounding area. Uh, it were primarily African American, uh, about, about 98 percent. But um, and then and then some of the students come from very um, some very tough some very tough backgrounds, some very tough um, home home situations. Yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine that primary care is a challenge for a lot of a lot of the people in that community. Having having good primary care and also a lot of, a lot of cases, some of our students uh, lack insurance. Uh, so being able to put, provide them a vehicle for getting some type of medical and um, medical screening, medical yeah. information is of great assistance to them. And also, we also get a number of people from the community coming in to also take advantage of the different screenings that we offer during the health fair. Yeah, yeah. So how did this partnership come come about? I mean, Oakland University is pretty far from the neighborhood he's talking about. It is, and uh, <laughs> OUWB itself is just a young institution. Right, right. We opened our doors in 2000. That's right, yeah. Uh, so the partnership actually came from Dr. Mary Doreski, who is on our biomedical sciences faculty, and Kelvin Wise. They actually had something together first before <laughs> I came on the scene. Okay, city. okay. In, in the summer of 2012, um, I was afforded a service learning opportunity with four of our students mm -hmm. and um, it was a project working with Dr. Doreski and she proposed that we put together a health fair for the community. Um, we started basically from scratch, no knowledge <laughs> base, no, no money, and put, <laughs> and put everything together and she was very impressed by that. And at that time she was with Wayne State University but later that fall she moved to, uh, she moved to Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine and thought that it would be a she really liked the institution, liked the job that we did, and thought it would be a good fit. Yeah. And so since that time, uh, Karen, Karen and I have been working together, yeah. and that January of 2013 was our first year. Right, yeah, right. It's continued to grow ever since. Yeah. Uh, talk about the, the sort of menu of screenings and things that you guys are offering at, the, at these health fairs. Well, that's a number of things that we're doing. So um, flu shots will be available yeah. for um, the community for free. We have cholesterol testing, glucose testing, vision screening, 
some of our uh, students who are part of the Student National Medical Association, they'll be there doing uh, uh, African dance. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be video games. There's uh, arts and crafts. So it's just a number of things that are happening. Yeah. Uh, but most importantly, there are also health education tables that will be there for the community at large to just grab more information about things that maybe they kind of heard about but really needed more information about. Yeah, yeah. What kind of feedback do you get from the students uh, at the med school <laughs> about participating in this? They love it. Like yeah. They fight to be a part <laughs> to be of part it. Of it? Yeah, so much so now that uh, quite a few of the student organizations are uh, really have their hands on it now with doing everything huh. um, for the programming. So uh, Kelvin and myself, we're really more like the facilitators <laughs> of everything taking place. They're in taking the charge of yeah, it. They're really yeah. running the show, but they do a phenomenal job with it. They they take ownership. They huh. get there early. They stay there late. <laughs> they clean up. Right. <laughs> they set up. So they do everything that they're supposed to do. And, and what about the students who you've sort of moved through uh, the program at this point? Uh, as you said, you open in. 2011, so you've had a couple graduating classes. Uh, have you had takers on the idea of, hey, this is the this is the work I want to go do? Uh, you know, a little bit. Yeah. You know, with OUWB still being uh, fairly young, mm -hmm. I don't think we've really determined yet what our thing is going to be. You're you know? Sort of specialty, right? Right. Yeah. So you know, some institutions, if you go to that school, you are you know primary care for others. You're mm -hmm. going to be or orthopedic surgery or whatever. We just don't know yet. But I think that's the beauty of our institution is that, regardless, all of those students that are coming in, getting their education, they're going out and doing phenomenal things yeah. and still being community minded. Yeah. Okay, well, congratulations uh, on six years and on a pretty phenomenal partnership between your two institutions. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay, finally today, a new handbook is providing useful information for people who come into contact with the criminal justice system. The book is being read in schools and church groups and prisoner reentry programs. The author is a bail bondswoman here in Southeast Michigan. Our One Detroit team has her story. Crystal Banks has been in the bail bonds business for 18 years. She meets a lot of people who don't understand some of the basics of how the criminal justice system works. And I started helping my client years ago. And every time I gave them more information, I noticed they weren't repeat offender. So I'm like, okay, I got to help them a little bit more. So I wrote a book. Don't Be a Dumb Criminal contains straight talking do's and don'ts that could help lawbreakers reduce their prison time. But Banks says it's just as much a handbook for upstanding citizens who want to protect their rights. I get people, church people, all the time, oh, I don't need that book. You don't know someone that has been in trouble? You don't think it could happen to you because you always do the right thing? Among the basics people in trouble with the law get wrong? Not hiring the right attorney. Banks says you should shop for an attorney like you're looking for a house. You don't buy the first one you see. When you go and look for an attorney, you need to talk to several attorneys. You don't want to hire an attorney that's going to tell you just what you want to hear. Banks explains how people need to know their Miranda rights. That is, stay silent. Everything is being recorded. When you are arrested, it's being recorded. When you go to jail, it's recorded. When you're in the cell with an inmate, a lot of times that's being recorded or they can use that inmate as a witness. When you're calling your family members and talking about it, it's all recorded and they're gonna use it against you. Don't Be a Dumb Criminal is a quick and easy read. Banks says a fifth grader can understand it. Meanwhile, she's visiting Detroit area schools, offering more tips that can help when young people have an encounter with the law. You would think people teach you this. It's just like I, I tell the youth, when you are applying for a job, you are your best. You are trying to be heard. You are trying to have an impression. You need to be like that when you're dealing with the police. Respectable, trying to give a good impression. In the bail bonds business, Banks interacts with the cops, lawyers, courts, social workers. It's complicated. You deal with all these people. You're getting all this education. Why not put it in a book to help people? I want to get everybody on the same level so they have a fair shake. You can get more information on Crystal Banks' book and all of our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. As always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time.
As American Black Journal looks ahead at the next 50 years, we want to hear from you, the viewers. Tell us what you think of this program and what you'd like to see on future episodes. Visit AmericanBlackJournal.org to take a quick survey and share your opinion. Thank you. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929.